get started learning about the Seder of the Seder. And what I mean by this is not necessarily what we know from the time really of Rashi, Rashi students of Kadesh or Chatz Karpas Yachatz, but rather we're going to go back in time trying to understand how and why the Seder as we know it in terms of the order in which we retell the story of Yitzhak Mitzrayim, why it appears as such. Namely, we know during the time definitely of the first Beit HaMikdash throughout really the beginnings of the second Beit HaMikdash, the way that the story was retold was subjective. Everyone would retell the story to their children in their own subjective manner. Imagine the scene that everyone gathered, focused almost like a campfire around the skewer, around the Karban Pesach, and that the Achila together with the Sipur would be the means through which and our people would then be engaged in a retelling the story of Yitzhak Mitzrayim. What we're going to take a look at together today is what in fact constitutes the mitzvah to write of Sipur Yitzhak Mitzrayim, where we are less, as we know, than a week and a half away from this phenomenal, not only experience, but opportunity, especially for parents. And as we know, each person for their own to fulfill this mitzvah to write down. What we're going to learn is that we only have a few hours in which to do so. So within the next half an hour, we're going to be learning how we're going to maximize the fulfillment of this mitzvah, the mitzvah of Sipur. But before we do that, in order to appreciate what this mitzvah is all about and how the Rambam, how Maimonides is going to classify it in a very clear manner, we're going to take a look at some of the basic ideas that we're going to find within the Mikolot themselves. So let's get started together. And, and a special thank you to FTA and Tanakh study for providing this wonderful opportunity for us to prepare for Pesach, for the Seder itself. We begin with understanding the relationship between the mitzvah of Zechira and the mitzvah of Sipur Yetziah Mitzrayim. For after all, we know that the Rambam in Halchud Chameitu Matzah actually counts the mitzvah of Zachor et Hayom Hazeh Asher Yetzata Mi Mitzrayim as a mitzvah asay shel Torah. Based on Shmo Perik Gimel, immediately after Yetziat Mitzrayim, Hashem tells Moshe not only of the mitzvah of Kadesh Liko Bahor, of sanctifying the firstborn, but also Zachor et Hayom Hazeh Asher Yetzatim Mi Mitzrayim. Remember the day. This explains the Rambam as the basis for the mitzvah to write the biblical imperative to retell the story on an annual basis. Rashi says, no, this is going to be the basis for us remembering Yitziat Mitzrayim on a daily basis. Shemaskirin Yitziat Mitzrayim b'chol yom. And where do we see this manifest as well, as well? In the famous Mishnah that we learned about not too long ago in the Sechah Brachot. It's obvious that we would mention Yitzhia Mitzrayim during the day, for that, in fact, is when we left. But why should we also mention Yitzhia Mitzrayim Balelot? What is the source for remembering the exodus from Egypt at night and thereby saying the third paragraph of Kriyat Shema, which on one hand is going to contain the mitzvah of Tzitzit, Ri'itamoto. I can't see that during the day, during the night, so I only have the mitzvah during the day. Maybe the same for Yitzhia Mitzrayim when we left Egypt during the day, Amar of Elezer ben Azariah, we know this also from the Haggadah, Arayani kiven shivim shana, from how he aged 52 years overnight, as Chazal explained before he replaced from Ban Gamliel as the Nasi of the Sanhedrin, v'lo zachiti shetamar yitziat mitzrayim balilot, ad shedrasha ben Zoma, until ben Zoma taught us the following, based on Dvarim Perek Tetzayim, l'ma'an tzizkor, one has to be engaged in mitzvot in order to remember the day of Yetziah Mitzrayim. Wait a second. All of your days. Those are the days themselves. Why do we need the additional inclusive terminology of kol yamechayacha? Explains Ben Zoma to include the leilot. From here we see that we have a mitzvah of Yetziah Mitzrayim every single day to remember Yitziat Mitzrayim, and that mitzvah applies at night as well. And therefore, we're a little surprised then. Why is it that Rashi uses the Pasuk Zachor Tayom Hazeh, whereas uh, according to the Rambam, the basis for Zachirat Yitziat Mitzrayim is Lema'an Tiskor, Et Yom Tetcham Me'eret Mitzrayim Kol Yemei 
just as the Mishnah explains. And let's see how the Ramam is going to refer to this mitzvah in the mitzvah do right of Kriyat Shema. He says, through the mitzvah, the biblical mandate of reciting Kriyat Shema, one also fulfills the mitzvah, Laskir Yitziat Mitzrayim Bayom Uvalayla. De facto, you also are going to fulfill the mitzvah remembering Yitziat Mitzrayim, not only during the days, but also at night. Shanamar, Lema'an Tzizkor, Et Yom Tetchaim Eretz Mitzrayim Kol Yemei Hayacha, and explains the Rambam. What is this mitzvah called? This is the mitzvah of Kriyat Shema, not of Sipur Yitziat Mitzrayim, not even of Zechirat Yitziat Mitzrayim, of remembering our exodus from Egypt, but rather this is how you fulfill the mitzvah of Kriyat Shema. Notice then that remembering the exodus from Egypt is in fact going to be subordinate to the mitzvah of Kriyat Shema, unlike what the Rambam is going to teach us in his Sefer HaMitzvot, Mitzvah Taseif Kuf Nun Zayin, the mitzvah there is Lisa Per Biyetziat Mitzrayim Belel Chamisha Asar Benisan to retell the story, to elaborate upon the story, to be engaged in storytelling. But this isn't going to be every night. Every night you have a mitzvah to remember Yetziat Mitzrayim. One night a year you have a biblical mandate to retell the story of Yetziat Mitzrayim. So the question is obviously, as you see, why does the Rambam count Sipur? The retelling as an independent mitzvah, whereas Zechira, remembering Yitziat Mitzrayim, is subordinate to the mitzvah of Kriyat Shema. And there are numerous answers for this, but for, perhaps one of the most famous is going to be, as you see here, adopted by the Karen Ora, Rav Yitzchak Mikarlin. And he asked the same question. Why doesn't the Rambam count Zechira to Yitziat Mitzrayim, remembering Yitziat Mitzrayim, which is a daily commandment, but he does count Sipur, which is only fulfilled one night of the year. That he does count as an actual commandment, independent of Kriyat Shema. And he says, and he asks, firstly, Zachorit Yom HaShabbat Lekatsho, Zachorit Asher Asalacha Amalek, each one, according to Maimonides, is an independent mitzvah. So shouldn't Yitziat Mitzrayim be as well? Zachor et Yom HaZer Asher Yitzat Ami Mitzrayim, but the Karen Or says, look carefully. The Rambam says, based on the Mishnah, what is the basis for remembering Yitziat Mitzrayim? Not Zachor, but rather Lema'an Tizkor. Every time you find the imperative of Zachor, the active commandment of Zachor, that's to teach us that we have an independent commandment to do something. Whereas Kriyat Shema, I am reciting Kriyat Shema, and de facto, I am thereby remembering Yitziat Mitzrayim. That's Lema'an Tiskor. That's not going to be an active, independent commandment. When do you find Zachor et Hayom Hazeh? On the day that you actually left Egypt, that's when you have an active commandment to remember. And it's not merely remembering, but an active remembrance. How do we actively remember? How do we share a collective memory? How do we engage in remembering? That's only through speech. That's going to be through the mitzvah of Sipur. Zechira is not mentioned belashon sivui when it comes to the daily commandment. When it comes to the one time a year commandment, that is zachor etayom hazeh. As the Rambam says, that's the basis for the mitzvah of Sipur Yitziat Mitzrayim. So if that's the case, then you can imagine that it is incumbent upon each and every one of us to fulfill this mitzvah of Sipur for the few hours that we have, basically from at the beginning of Tzeta Kochavim until we turn into pumpkins, so to speak, together with the Karban Pesach at Chatzot, even though the mitzvah can continue as we know, Kola Marbe Hareza Mishubach. So we have just a few hours to fulfill this mitzvah of retelling the story of Yitzhak Mitzrayim. Well, what characterizes the story? How are we going to know how to fulfill this mitzvah? This is what I meant by placing Seder to the Seder. The Tana'im already gave us an order through which we're going to accomplish this. We're going to begin with what's known historically as a Mishnah Kedumah. The original version of the Mishnah wherein the Tana'im are going to relegate for us the various stages, the various order through which we're going to engage in Sipur Yitziat Mitzrayim. Let's take a look at this famous Mishnah, Mesech Psachim, Dav Kuf Tetzayin Amad Aleph. Mazgulo Kosheni, after an interesting discussion between Rabbi Yekiva and Chachamim, whether or not the first cup 
over which we sanctify the day, Kiddush, counts as one of the four kosot, the four cups of wine. The Mishnah continues and says, by the second cup, this is going to be the cup of Magid. This is going to be the cup over which we are going to retell the story. How does it begin then? I'm expecting to hear. And this is where the father, the mother, sit down with their children and begin. Once upon a time, we were slaves in Egypt, but actually, Han Haben Shoel Aviv. And the Mishnah begins by teaching us that the story begins with a child asking the question. It begins with the Socratic method. It begins with the child being engaged as well. And therefore, we're going to see that according to my mom, the Rambam tells us what you really need to do to engage your child. Turn the seating around. Make sure that they're egozim. That's once upon a time, the candies of, of the Rambam's time. And make sure that they're engaged. If the child is too young, if the child is not going to ask, then of course we still have the mitzvah of teaching. That's going to be stage number one, retelling through questions. Stage number two. How should the father, the mother, retell the story according to the order of start with the gnut, the gnai, the negative, and end with the praiseworthy? And then the next part of the Mishnah we find is going to be after the questions, then after, then at the initial answers, we start again. The doresh marami ovedavi. It's not enough just to retell, even with gnut and shach, you have to then be engaged in an extrapolatory manner. You're going to be engaged with exegesis. You are going to do rish, you are going to ask your story. And then comes stage number four. Ramban Gamliel haya omer, ko shalo amar shlosha dvarim ilu bepesach, lo yata yedei chobato, and there's a machloket rishonim. Does that mean that whoever does not say, then these three aspects of Pesach, Pesach, Matzah, Umaror, linking the Karban Pesach both to the bitterness of the past and also the Matzah of the future, the Matzah of the Exodus itself, Lo Chobato, did not fulfill the Chova, the obligation of eating them, or the obligation of Sipor Yetziat Mitzrayim. And clearly, the Amira, the reciting of Pesach, Matzah, Umaror is going to be linked then to the storytelling itself. And if we had more time, we would actually then look through the Rambam and see how Maimonides places an order exactly based on this Mishnah. Mitzvah lahodia labanim. Technically, we have a mitzvah to inform our children of this historic story, and we're going to see why. This is going to be, he says, your biblical mandate. Maximize it. Make sure that you spend the next week and a half in quarantine in your homes, doing everything possible, not only not to maintain, not only to maintain sanity, but certainly to prepare properly to teach your children to fulfill this biblical commandment. How does it start again? Halacha gimel, do whatever you need to do. La so chinoi balayla. This is a time to think of creative mechanisms and methods in which to engage our children so that they'll ask. And then when we do begin the mitzvah to write of retelling, Ketzad Matril, Mesaper, we start with the Gnut and we continue with the Shvach. And notice how the Rambam, as we continue through the Halachot, explains exactly based on the Mishnah. We have to continue. Komi Shalom Pesach. You have to recite Pesach Matzah Maror. The Rambam's terminology in the above Halachot clearly express not only step by step the fulfillment of the order through which you fulfill Yetziat Mitzrayim, the Sipur of Yetziat Mitzrayim, but we're going to see that it ends with not only reciting the three aspects, our three props, but ultimately giving thanksgiving to God. What we're going to do now is we're going to return for a moment to that initial Mishnah and see how the Gemara already elaborates. We notice that the next stage of the Mishnah was even to give us examples of some of the questions that a child is going to ask the parent. This is what we know as the Arba Kushiot, the four questions, Man Nishtana Halayla Hazeh. Have them ask about Matzah and Maror. Have them ask once upon a time about Basar Tlisha Luk. According to Rav Sadia Gaon, he still incorporated the question of why do we eat the barbecued Karban Pesach instead of cooking it. But as we know, unfortunately, we don't ask this question today. Rather, we go on with, oh, why do we dip twice? And then why do we say, why do we have the mitzvah to recline on the night of the Seder? But let's continue then. 
after we have standardized questions that the child can in fact ask regardless of age, then we have the father, the mother, beginning the fulfillment of the mitzvah of Sipur Yetziat Mitzrayim in the order of matchil bignut umesayim b'shvach. Start with the negative and then continue with the positive. What is this? Asked the Gemara. Well, there's a machloket. My bignut, Rav Amar, mitchila obdei avodat glulim hayu avotenu. Rav says, the negative was that once upon a time, our forefathers were worshippers of avodah zarah. They worshipped idolatry. Shmuel Amar, avadim hayinu leparav ben Mitzrayim. Shmuel explains the gnut was that we were enslaved by Paro in Mitzrayim. Now, if I ask you, and just for a moment then, I'm going to stop the share to ask all of you, and from just looking at this machlok, at this dispute between Rav and Shmuel, what are the differences in their approaches? Matchil bignut umesayim b'shvach. Rav says, well, once upon a time, this was terrible. We worshipped Avodah Zarah, whereas according to Shmuel, and the gnut, the negative, was that we were enslaved by Paro. We were slaves in Egypt. What are some of the basic differences? So you can unmute yourselves for a moment. And if not, then I'm just going to give you the answers. But much better, as we've seen, is certainly the dynamic Socratic method. So, Rebecca. Um, were we actively sinning or was somebody doing something bad to us? Beautiful. Excellent. What a sophisticated answer, right? Most people explain the basic difference is that Rav is focusing on a much more spiritual type of enslavement and Shmuel on a more physical, but Rebecca's right. Notice the terminology in their different views of history. Rav is, Rav is explaining, the active verbs. Once upon a time, our forefathers chose to worship strange gods. They were polytheists, where Shmuel noticed the passive terminology of Adin Hayinu Leparo B'Mitzrayim. They have very different views of how we should look at history. They have different views of how we're going to record coronavirus for generations to come. Do we say that we chose something and mitchila hayu avotenu ovdei avodah zara are our choices what lead to the consequences in history as Rav maintains? Or according to Shmuel, avadim hayinu. No, there's a divine destiny. This is what would have happened no matter what. After all, God had promised Abraham Avinu in the famous Brit Bein HaBetarim, Beger Yezarecha Baret Lolahem, Babadu Mino Otamar Bami Ochana, Ba'acharech Enyetzu Berchush Gadol, your children, your grandchildren are going to be slaves in a strange land, and after that, I'll redeem it. So do we look at, at the Odyssey as something that is also in the hands of man? Our choices change and determine history? Or is it, in fact, as Shmuel said, much more divinely ordained? And both of these approaches are going to have numerous ramifications. Rav believes, therefore, that the only way that you can truly understand any event in Jewish history is through a sign curve. And I know that you've seen too many graphs over the past few weeks, but he says, look at all of history as such. Note then that you can't just look at one idea or one event in history, because everything is going to be a result of something before. You want to understand what's going on today with coronavirus? Well, maybe we really do have to go back to 1918, to the Spanish influenza. Maybe we have to go back to the bubonic plague in order to understand these different phenomena that take place that we actually contribute, whether it's to the mutations of various virus, whether it's to the response universally, and as to how we deal with quarantines, whatever the case may be, Rav says, everything travels as light through a sign curve. And therefore, you can't take away or you can't focus on one aspect of history without looking at the broader approach. Shmuel is much more a, a supporter of quantum physics. He believes that history, like light, travels in particles. And therefore, you can. You can look at one event in history, for after all, he believes that this is much more divine. And therefore, you can isolate one event. We're going to take a look now, and I'm going to share with you the Haggadah, a beautiful way to begin our preparation for fulfilling the, this mitzvah to say, because we have to have an understanding of what, in fact, we're sharing with our children. What did the Baalei Haggadah, the later Amoraim, the Ga'onim, what did they decide to do in what we consider now our written Haggadah? How are we going to retell the story? Well, now we're going to look at an actual Haggadah to get a better sense of, and of what the, the Seder is all about. 
let's look and see the order, in fact, of the Seder. We begin, as you know, with Halach Ma'anya. In addition to inviting people in, okay, maybe not this year, but we recite the, the Gaonic phrase written in Aramaic, Hashata Hacha. This year we're here. Lishana Ba'ad Ba'arat Yisrael. Next year, Be'ezrat Hashem, we shall be in the land of Israel. And how do we end the entire Seder? Lishana Habad Yerushalayim, already telling us that there is a clear order to their retelling. We begin and with Lishan Haba Ba'arat Yisrael and notice the bookend, we have an inclusio format. But then, as we said, we're going to fulfill this mitzvah of Sipur. So we begin, just as the Mishnah said, begin with Haben Shoel Aviv. Begin with a dynamic method of having the children ask the questions, exactly the questions that we saw in our Mishnah, the famous four She'elot, looking at what's there. Now, I would think, based on the Gemara, that now we're going to hear the next stage, Matril Begnutu Masayim Beshvach, in the order in which we saw in the Gemara. Namely, firstly, Rav's approach. Notice that first we have the answer given by Shmuel. Teaching us that perhaps because Shmuel is going to focus on that isolated event in history, explaining how this is relevant for our times as well, this is a much shorter approach. So much so that think Lahavdil of Rav and Shmuel both serving as professors of Jewish history in Hebrew University today. And they both have to offer different courses in Malchut the Israel, Jewish autonomy in the lands of Israel. Which one would you sign up for? I can imagine that Rav's course would probably begin hmm, around the time of King David, whereas Shmuel's course would begin in 1948. And just look at this event in history. So now we see Avadim Hayinu Leparo B'Mitzrayim. Shmuel says, just talk about how we were enslaved in a Mitzrayim, how God determined this as such. And therefore, what's the Shvach? Clearly, God took us out. He put us there. He took us out. And how is the story relevant to us today, thousands of years thereafter? Had that event not taken place? explains the Shmuel school of thought. We and our children and descendants would still be enslaved to Paro in Egypt. Now with all the revolutions today and with the democratic system, it's hard to imagine that we would still be slaves to Paro and building pyramids in Egypt. Rather, what Shmuel is saying is that we would probably have completely assimilated within the Egyptian culture had God not taken us out at that very moment, had we missed that little quantum leap, then that would have been it for the identification of Am Yisrael. We would still be in Egypt. We would be defined as, as Egyptians. And therefore, Shmuel's approach helps us appreciate how that time period, how that very moment was of and utter significance to the future of Jewish history. Let's go again, Jacob. Jacob? Let's go on. Afilo kulano. Now, according to Shmuel's approach, this may seem as very simplistic. Maybe that's why the Balei Haggadah put his opinion first in order to make sure that every parent would at least fulfill the basic obligation of retelling the story. Even if your children have to go to sleep, you can definitely fulfill Shmuel's approach. That's why we need to hear about the famous five stars, the five Tanaim who were particularly in Bnei Brak by their younger disciple, Aya Rabbi Akiva, post the Hadrianic persecution, in order for us to appreciate that these are the Tanaim, the leading sages of the generation, and they have plenty to say. To tell them that it's already time for Kriyachma of Shacharit. And that's why we also need Rav Elazar ben Azariah to remind us that there's something special that's going on tonight. Every night we remember Yitziat Mitzrayim, the night of the Seder, we have an order. We have a, a mechanism through which to ensure the fulfillment of mitzvah sipur yitziat mitzrayim. What then is the ultimate shvach, according to Shmuel's approach? Baruch hamakom baruch hu, blessed be God. He's the one who organizes, who is going to, uh, to be the guider of our entire trajectory of Jewish history. Baruch shenatan Torah l'amo Yisrael. We pa pa pass basically that quantum of yitziat mitzrayim. Then we went on to Mamad Har Sinai. That's it, says Shmuel. That's what tonight's story is all about. Rav, as you know, is going to have a much more complex understanding of history. 
Rav is going to explain in order to understand even the story of the Yitzhak Mitzrayim, you're going to have to go back at least 400 years. You have to understand and appreciate the, the sign curve. You have to understand that in order for you to appreciate how this is relevant, go back numerous generations and see how our choices led to the consequences therein. And therefore, if we have to begin again with the questions of the child, then obviously the simplistic, very pointed questions of Manishtana are not going to be relevant for Rav's answer. And therefore, we quote a very famous Mechilta based on the fact that four times in Chamishachum Shei Torah, we hear the Gadot HaLevincha, we hear that we are required to teach this to our children, to make sure that this is going to be relevant to our child. A child that does not participate, a Jew who doesn't participate in the night of the Seder is going to be Chayav Karet. This is our opportunity to ensure that Jewish identity is perpetuated for generations to come. And how do we do that? We engage our children. But we don't just engage young children with very pointed, clear questions. We engage even the Chacham, the Rasha, the Tam, Sheino Yodea Lishol. Here we clearly see the Mechilta addressing more sophisticated questions asked by four different children, or maybe even four different sides to who we are, four different stages of moral, ethical, intellectual development. Whatever the case may be, this is going to be much more in tune and consistent, clearly, with Rav's approach of history. And therefore, based on Rav, Yachol mi Rosh Chodesh, maybe I can start from Rosh Chodesh because I need to talk about numerous, hundreds of years of Jewish history. No, you have to do it. Try to get it all in, in an intense format. Vavur zeh. At the same time that there's Matzah and Maror, Munachim lefanacha. Back to Rav, start with the Gnut. Metzchila ovdei avodah zarah hayu avoteinu. Once upon a time, our forefathers worshipped other gods. Now God gave us the opportunity for us to worship him. Notice in the verses that are quoted for Rav are going to be from Sefer Yehoshua because in Rav's mind, it doesn't make a difference. You can quote from Yehoshua. You can quote from Sefer Malachim because after all, history is continuous. It's along the same horizontal and vertical fronts. And as such, what is the Shvach? Baruch Shomer Haftachato. Not Baruch Shanatan, something in the past. We finished that period of history. We're now ready to move on, not according to Rav. Baruch Shomer in the present. Ripping Haftarim did not expire according to Rav. It still exists today. Today, it may not be Egypt. Today, it may not be pogroms. Today, it's a virus. Baruch Shomer Haftachato Yisrael Baruchum. Don't worry. If you understand history is continuous, then you will appreciate that Ripping Haftarim is continuous as well. God already told Abraham that, yes, he knew what was going to happen hundreds of years later, and therefore we raise our glasses and we say, This is what has persisted and remained both for our forefathers of the past and also for us. No, we're not referring to the cup of wine. We're referring to the the shvu'ah, the oath, the promise that God has given us that will forever, ever be relevant. And what is that promise? Whatever form it may be, it may be a, an inquisition, it may be a pogrom, it may be a crusade, it may be a holocaust, it may be a virus, but we're not worried. And therefore, Rav's approach is the perfect segue then, not only to hear about how these stories continue, and therefore we make the story relevant to our children by explaining to them we're still living, we're actually reliving the story of Yetziat Mitzrayim today. And therefore, what's the next stage? Say Ulamad, the Hebrew translation of Tashma. Go out, go out and engage in the story. Take a look at what we do. We quote all different Rashot. This is the time for us to elaborate on the story, to have the Devray Torah contest or whatever it is that you may do at your Seder. Have people talk, have people speak about their experiences of a personal gu'ula of redemption throughout the year. Engage Arami Obedavi. Notice that we carry the same theme and the same order of Matzchil Dignut, whether my father Yaakov, Abraham, Lavan was a wandering Armenian. We talk about all of the different extra extrapolatory homiletics as we engage even more. And the more that we go into detail of the story, the more that we can retell the story, the more we enter the story, not only the Gnut, but also the Shvach, 
כמה מעלות טובות למקום עלינו. In the second section, ברוך המקום ברוך הוא, now we're going to engage in detail על אחת כמה וכמה. טובה, כבולה ומכופלת למקום עלינו. שהוציאנו ממצרים, and God took us out and brought us even to the Torah, and brought us to Eretz Yisrael. We engage in detail. And as we do that, I hope for hours on end, then what else do we do? Ramban Gamliel says, use the props, engage. Don't just tell the story. The story is going to become a drama. And in order for the drama to truly come to life, you have to pick up your props. As we know, Tzvaradim do this so beautifully, taking the matzah on their shoulders and a spilling water on the floor, jumping over for Kriyat Yamsuf. Whatever it is that you do, Pesach Matzah Maror. Go and start building pyramids in your living room, whatever it may be, in order to truly, as we say, fulfill the whole Dovador. Hayav Adam explains the Mishnah, Lerot et Atzmo. What is the goal of these four stages of our order of retelling the story? Of fulfilling the mitzvah of Sipor Yetzirah Mitzrayim is Lerot et Atzmo, or as the Rambam beautifully says, Laharot et Atzmo. Show your child how the story is relevant to you. Show the child how you believe in the importance, not just of history of the past, but in history of the present. Make it your story. And if you do that, then you'll be able to properly tell the story in a way that you can be ensured that your children will retell the story to your grandchildren. You have to personalize the story. You have to truly believe that Hashem redeemed you. And that's why we take the props. And the more we enter the story, the more we can separate the actor from the story. Daniel Radcliffe will always be Harry Potter. Sylvester Stallone will always be Rocky. We will always be Lahabdil. We will always be part of the history, part of the Jewish people whom God took out of Egypt. And therefore, we recite We're part of the story. And if we're part of the story, then what happens to us? Then spontaneously, Therefore, we are obligated then to burst forth as we do. We can't help it. We're going to burst forth in song. And when our children see this, when they know that the story means something to us, and we have properly engaged and fulfilled the mitzvah of Sipur, then we can then, with full confidence, say the final blessing of Sipur Yetziat Mitzrayim. Thank you, God. Asher Galan Nu. Thank you for redeeming us. Oh, yes. That's right. I didn't forget. You also redeemed our forefathers, and therefore I know that the cycle continues, whether it's as quantums or whether it's as a sine curve. I know that the Brit Bein Hamtarim has never expired, and it is my responsibility, every single Jew's responsibility on the night of the Seder, to ensure that we don't just go through the order, check, check, but the order should be a natural order of progression, so that we feel that we're part of the continuous story of redemption. And if we are, then we know that there's going to be continuous redemption. Then we know that wherever we are right now, we're in quarantine, we know it may take days, weeks, but we're going to enter into not just a new stage, not even just to go back to where we were before. We're going to go on to a better stage. Then we'll be able to open up in song to God, Shir Chadash, a beautiful story that I heard on what this will end today from my next door neighbor, Miriam Weitman, about her father, Rabbi Manuel, who was uh, sitting next to his mother in Bergen Belsen on her deathbed retelling the story, the Haggadah, fulfilling the mitzvah of Sipur Yetziat Mitzrayim in a reverse fashion, a child telling this to his mother. And he said years later that he wasn't able, looking around at Bergen Belsen, seeing all the dead bodies, he wasn't able to finish the bracha, Baruch Atah Hashem Ga'al Yisrael, not truly believing that God would ever redeem us from that state. 22 years later, he says, he can't believe it. He's a sandik at his grandson's birth in Yerushalayim that had I only known 22 years earlier that I would have the schut to uh, move to Eretz Yisrael with a surviving brother and sister, had I only known that I'd be able to come to Eretz Yisrael and raise seven children in Yerushalayim, had I only known that I would have the schut on Eretz Pesach, to be a son to that, my grandchild, my grandson's brit milah, 
And of course, I would have been able to end with Baruch Atah Hashem Ga'al Yisrael. May we all have an opportunity this Seder to see ourselves as part of living history and thereby with a full emotional conviction be able to transmit the story, lay Seder to the Seder, and thereby burst forth not only in song to Hashem on that night, but with confidence that there will be future redemptions as well. Hag Sameach, Hasher Ubari, and Bahatzlacha Raba. I wish all of you. Hag Sameach, thank you. Hag Sameach, thank you. Hag Sameach, thank you. Beautiful. Thanks, so wonderful to see all of you. Well, really thank you, Shani. Thank you, to Jesse. Uh, thank you, Rob Jesse, for putting this all together. Phenomenal day of learning. And on to your next classes. Take advantage of this fantastic opportunity.